historians still debate whether the Constitution is truly an anti-slavery document. It's, it seems that the change of belief on Douglas's part could have been more about political expediency than an actual change of heart. Okay, so that's, a, that's an excellent question. And in a way, the, the answer is in the question. So yes, absolutely. Historians are still debating whether the Constitution is pro-slavery or anti-slavery. And I think a consensus is that it was pro-slavery because it had a three-fifths clause uh, that blacks counted at, enslaved black people counted as three-fifths towards the uh, representation in Congress from Southern states. Uh, so, yeah, so the three-fifths clause has led a lot of historians to say that the Constitution was pro-slavery. There's another way of thinking about the this though, and that's the way that Douglas comes at it. And, and if you're interested, you can go online and do Douglas and the Constitution, you'll find some of his famous speeches. He says, even though you have some of the stuff about the fugitive slave law, the spirit of the Constitution is all about freedom. And then you could say, well, that's a good argument to make in the 1850s, um, you know, when he wants to become more of a political abolitionist. But I think it's a pretty good argument. So I think people kind of go back and forth on this. Uh, literally, it seems the Constitution was, was pro-slavery. But yeah, there's a kind of anti-slavery spirit to it. And if you look back at the Declaration of Independence, and if you look at Douglas's at, at Thomas Jefferson's autobiography, where he gives the full draft of the uh, Declaration of Independence, and you can find that in any anthology. Jefferson is all about attacking slavery. So there is an anti-slavery spirit in the Declaration, even though Jeff Jefferson eventually will have 200 slaves on his plantation. Awesome, thank you. A uh, question from Andrea, a very timely one, I think, for everyone. Um, they asked for personal connections for students to make uh, to keep them interested and help them understand Douglas's message. Would it be wise to bring up today's accounts and situations, uh, modern examples such as the Black Lives Matter movement? Absolutely. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I, part of the reason that I began the talk by talking about my situation in the state of Maryland is uh, I use that material. The debate for, I mean, one of the things that's been going on with the Black Lives Matter debate uh, or movement is debate over statues. So how interesting for me in Maryland that there is a statue celebrating the young men who fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War. It's still there and it was voted that it's gonna stay there. So um, what's that say about Talbot County and where Douglas was born? Uh, what's that say about the state of Maryland that that's still here? And I think that, yeah, Douglas's, every, all of Douglas's writings speak to the theme of Black Lives Matter. I mean, everything that he wrote, starting with the speeches he gave for Garrison and then the narrative, uh, the idea that he should not be in slavery and why should he be in slavery? Once Douglas gets, if you do end up teaching the narrative, once Douglas gets to, to New Bedford, which was a city, you know, city in Massachusetts that was a free state, he faces racism. And so uh, both the narrative and my bondage and my freedom end with Douglas attacking racism in the North. So it's not just in the North end, but it's in the South. And I'm, um, yeah, I think everything has to say is, is about Black Lives Matter. One of the things that I was told in, in the form I got from the, the Texas standards is uh, you shouldn't politicize things. Um, and I, I could imagine uh, from school to school that some places might feel that Black Lives Matter, uh, if, if it's kind of gung-ho, Douglas is all about this, that might be seen as politicizing things. I am happy to, in my own teaching to politicize things, but I'm at a university. It's a different context. Very fair. Um, question uh, asking if you can say a little bit more about how Douglas shaped uh, and or adjusted his rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetorical strategies based on his understanding of the audiences that he was writing for. Yeah. Um, 
One thing I'll say is if you, I think if you type in my name or if you email me, I can give you a reference, but I have an essay in a rhetoric journal that focuses precisely on that question. So uh, Douglas is very interesting because he could, he could adjust his speeches for different audiences. Uh, people aren't aware that Douglas spoke many, many times to all black audiences. And when he did that, he was very aggressive. Uh, for example, when he's attacking Andrew Johnson before a white audience, he refers to President Johnson. When he is attacking Andrew Johnson before a black audience, he refers to him as Massa Johnson. You know, the idea that this guy was head of a slave plantation. Uh, my essay talks about Douglas, Douglas's lectures on Abraham Lincoln. When Douglas spoke to white Republicans, he celebrated Abraham Lincoln. When Douglas spoke to blacks, he said, Abraham, didn't, Abraham Lincoln did not free us. We freed ourselves. And that remains a historiographic debate. Uh, because there are historians who say, uh, we don't talk much about how blacks were really central to ending slavery. We just say, Lincoln freed the slaves. So uh, Douglas, reached out to white audiences. I think he, if they were in his camp, as they were, I think, with the what to the slave is the 4th of July speech, he could be very aggressive. Uh, in the 1840s, when he wasn't sure they were in his camp, he didn't have that same kind of anger, and he tried to connect to white audiences through sentimentalism. You know, I am a child, I'm missing my mother, I'm missing my grandmother. Those kinds of things are, are in the narrative. After the Civil War, he speaks to a wide, range of audiences, and he always adjusts, particularly with Abraham Lincoln, he adjusts what he has to say about Lincoln. I could go on about this, but.